Now, when people say the Middle East conflict is complicated, it's because of things like this. These suitcases are full of American banknotes, $15 million worth, and they were taken into Gaza back in 2018 through an Israeli-controlled crossing. Now, that might sound strange because of Israel's vow to eradicate Hamas, but of all the reasons why that might not be possible, and we'll get to those, this one might be the strangest. The money in the suitcases comes from Qatar, which has sent hundreds of millions of dollars into Gaza through Israel in the past decade to do things like keep the power on, pay public servants and to help poor families. Now, according to Reuters, it works like this. Qatar electronically transfers cash to Israel. That cash is then physically carried over the border by UN officials and by Israeli officials into Gaza. Now, there is no way that money could go into Gaza through Israel without the knowledge and the approval of Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. And in fact, his former defence minister basically confirmed that when he quit in protest after the last Gaza ceasefire in 2018. It's not a secret that there were also, in the past few months, disagreements between the Prime Minister and myself. And I'll simply remind of the issue of, in, of issuing Qatari cash, which I thought was a mistake. And only after the Prime Minister sent, issued a written statement, I was forced to allow the money inside, inside the Strip. Saudi Arabia's former intelligence chief also called it out just after this latest conflict began. I condemn Israel for funneling Qatari money to Hamas. The auto Hamas. The question is why? Why would Israel's Prime Minister, the man who has sworn to eradicate Hamas, the man whose entire political identity is the only person who can keep Israelis safe, why would he allow it? In 2019, the Israeli newspaper Haaretz reported Netanyahu telling a meeting of his party that anyone who wants to prevent the creation of a Palestinian state needs to support strengthening Hamas. This is part of our strategy, he reportedly said, to divide the Palestinians between those in Gaza and those in the West Bank. That same year, former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak told Army Radio that Netanyahu's strategy is to keep Hamas alive and kicking in order to weaken the Palestinian Authority. It's easier to explain to Israelis, he said, that there's no one to sit with and no one to talk to. Now, Benjamin Netanyahu denies that this is the point. In a very recent interview with Politico, he said it was a big lie that he wanted to build up Hamas. He called it ridiculous. He said, you don't go to war three times with Hamas or do major military operations if you want to build them up. But the money was going into Gaza. And whether that was for humanitarian reasons or for political reasons, the fact remains that Hamas was getting the money and being left to operate inside the Gaza Strip. Now that arrangement may help to explain just why Israel's security services were so utterly blindsided by the atrocities of October 7th. <laughs> The worst massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. More than 1,200 dead, 120 taken hostage. And those attacks have completely changed the equation. An English button. We've sworn, I've sworn to eradicate Hamas. Nothing will stop us. We will continue this war until we reach our three objectives. Free all of our hostages, eliminate Hamas till the end, and to ensure that we won't face such a threat from Gaza ever again. But is eradicating Hamas even possible? Well, on paper, you could be forgiven for thinking so. Israel is one of the most powerful military forces in the world. Israel controls the land, the sea and the air around Gaza. It has a standing military force of nearly 200,000 and it's mobilised 300,000 more reservists for this conflict. Estimates of the Hamas fighting force range between 15 and 40,000. So why wouldn't Israel be able to wipe out its much weaker enemy? Well, for a start, urban warfare is notoriously difficult for the attacking force. Gaza is one of the most densely populated places in the world. 
2.1 million people crammed into an area half the size of Canberra. It's incredibly built up. Most of the buildings are five or six storeys high, densely packed in a maze of streets and alleyways. So soldiers going in there can be attacked from the front, they can be attacked from behind, and they can be attacked from on high, from soldiers taking positions in apartment buildings. Each building is a potential battleground and also a potential target. The narrow streets make it really difficult to see what might be ahead. And even though Gaza is small, the fact that Gaza is literally fenced in actually makes it more complicated. Its border along the sea is just 40 kilometres long. Its land border has a fence that stops anyone from getting in or out. The entire strip covers an area of just 362 square kilometres. The most densely populated part of it is Gaza City. Before the war, there were about 700,000 people packed into just 52 square kilometres. This is not the open battlefield that many armies are built to fight on. Those tanks that were lined up outside Gaza before the invasion, they're a lot less useful once they get inside. So Israeli soldiers have to fight street to street, eliminating any enemy as they go. That's why Israel has started attacking from the north, methodically working its way towards Gaza City. 60% of the buildings in Gaza have been damaged or destroyed. It's the area in the north that's taken the most damage, and the destruction is largely following the path of Israel's ground invasion. Videos from social media and TV reports from those areas show how buildings have just been levelled. Israel is trying to eliminate places that Hamas fighters can hide, but with so many civilians in the area, it's very tricky. Israel has repeatedly warned civilians to get out of the area. At one stage, it dropped thousands of leaflets from the sky, telling civilians to move south. But a lot of people haven't been able to get out of North Gaza, or they don't want to. And that means Hamas can continue to hide amongst civilians, operating from private homes or public buildings. We do expect to see civilian casualties as a result of this campaign. Um, that is sadly true in all wars. It is especially tr going to be true in a war in a crowded urban environment where the opponent, Hamas, is using civilians as human shields and hiding themselves, hiding their fighters, hiding their infrastructure behind civilians. Now, Hamas has long been condemned for using civilians as human shields. And this conflict's no different, most recently by the European Union. Now, international law is very clear. Even if Hamas is using civilians as human shields, it's up to Israel as the attacker to protect civilians from disproportionate harm. The ceasefire ended, the bombing started again, and hundreds of people have already been killed. And Israel got this very strong message from its most powerful backer. You see, in this kind of a fight, the center of gravity is the civilian population. And if you drive them into the arms of the enemy, you replace a tactical victory with a strategic defeat. So I have repeatedly made clear to Israel's leaders that protecting Palestinian civilians in Gaza is both a moral responsibility and a strategic imperative. Now Israel says it does everything it can to minimise civilian casualties. And it talks about things like those warnings it gave to people in the north of Gaza to get to safety in the south. But in the first 40 days of this conflict, more people have been killed than in the last 15 years of fighting between Israel and Hamas. Navigating all of that makes this an incredibly complex mission for Israel. This will not be a quick battle. If you want a historical comparison, you could look at somewhere like Mosul in Iraq, which was another heavily built up urban battlefield. There were an estimated 5,000 Islamic State fighters in Mosul at the start of that operation. It took 252 days to clear them. Hamas's military force is significantly bigger than that. And unlike in Mosul, people in Gaza have nowhere to go. Hamas has had years to prepare for this. And buildings above the ground are not the only place its fighters can hide. In fact, the biggest tactical advantage Hamas has may well be 
the network of tunnels that runs underneath the entire area. Hamas claims to have built around 500 kilometres of tunnels under Gaza, with entrances all over the place. The Israeli military calls it the Gaza Metro because it gives Hamas fighters the ability to move around and surround its soldiers, trapping them in the maze of Gaza's streets. Now, it's not clear just how big the tunnel network is, but these lines show tunnels the IDF says it destroyed back in 2021. This video claiming to show the labyrinth under Gaza was posted by the militant group Islamic Jihad on October 22nd. That text in Hebrew and Arabic says, hell awaits you. In November, the IDF released its own video claiming to show a tunnel network under a civilian home close to the main Al Shifa hospital. And then you can see the tunnel shop. It was covered with the floor. Now we're going down inside the tunnel shop. And here you can see we're entering into the tunnel. This other video, also released by the RDF, claims to show a tunnel under a mosque. Now, none of these videos have been verified, but nor is there any doubt that the tunnels exist. Some of the released hostages have talked about them, like this 85-year-old woman who was one of the first to get out. We went for hours underground. It was humid. It looked like a spider web. Now, the tunnels don't just allow for quick movement of fighters around Gaza. They also allow Hamas to stockpile weapons, food and medical supplies long before it ever provoked an attack from Israel. It also means they can resupply during a ceasefire. Which, in a strange way, kind of takes us back to those suitcases full of cash. Now, Israel has now stopped the supply of money going into Gaza from Qatar, which means public servants aren't getting paid. But the flow of aid is now also at a trickle. It's down to just a handful of trucks going in a day. Now, before this war, there were up to 500 trucks a day going into Gaza. So eventually we will see more people dying from disease than we're even seeing from the bombardment if we are not able to put back this health system and provide the basics of life, food, water, medicines and of course fuel to operate the hospitals. Israel is under international scrutiny and pressure over what it's doing in Gaza like never before. And that could be the biggest obstacle of all, to pull back the assault long before they've got even close to wiping out Hamas for good.